All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Joe Sertich. I'm the curator of dinosaurs here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I'm coming to you live from my favorite place in the museum, our collections basement. So behind me is a brilliant white wall. I'm in these sterile hospital room uh, cabinets and shelves. And all around me are fossils from a time period that a lot of you probably know, the Jurassic. So this is the, the Jurassic dinosaurs of Colorado. Uh, today, I'm going to show you some of our amazing collections that you probably haven't seen before. Uh, but before I do that, I want to jump in and give you a little bit of the history of uh, the Morrison Formation, the Jurassic, and Colorado's place in that history. So give me a second here to share my slides. Let's see. There we go. All right. Uh, so a lot of you have uh, probably seen me do some of these science lives in the past, and you probably know that I am a Cretaceous dinosaur guy. So I love things like T-Rex and Triceratops, Taurosaurus, and some of their older relatives like Cosmoceratops from Utah, uh, Pentaceratops from New Mexico, and all the other weird duck-billed dinosaurs and raptor dinosaurs that lived alongside them. But like most uh, most paleontologists, I really got excited about dinosaurs from the Jurassic. And so it was these dinosaurs, things like Stegosaurus and Allosaurus, uh, that really ignited my imagination and made me want to become a paleontologist. And today I want to share with you uh, a little bit about those Jurassic dinosaurs. So here you see some of those iconic dinosaurs this is an Allosaurus fighting Colorado state fossil, the Stegosaurus. Uh, along the time, the timeline you see at the top, uh, is the age of dinosaurs. So dinosaurs appeared in the Triassic about 245 million years ago. Uh, by the Jurassic time, the blue bar at the top, they were starting to dominate the ecosystem. So all of the big dinosaurs were starting to appear, uh, things like the long-necked sauropods. And by the very end of the Jurassic, that's when we have uh, our best known Jurassic dinosaurs from here in North America, and especially here in Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West. And then again, by the, the Cretaceous, you have things like Horned dinosaurs, Triceratops, Taurosaurus, uh, and ultimately T. rex living here in the Western US. But for today, I want to focus on the Jurassic because it's such a cool time period. So this is a view of what the Morrison Formation looks like. Uh, scientists have been digging the Morrison Formation for well over a century. Uh, you can see a little quarry in the middle of this uh, view where people are digging down to get to some dinosaur bones. Uh, this picture is from Utah. So this is an exposure of the Morrison Formation in Utah. Uh, but really the Morrison Formation is known from really the entire Rocky Mountain West. So here you can see stars representing major discoveries in the Morrison Formation. They range from Southern Montana uh, into Wyoming, Eastern Utah, uh, down South, there are sites in Arizona, the Four Corners area, New Mexico, and even in the Oklahoma Panhandle. So getting out into the Great Plains, but it's Colorado that is set right in the middle of the Jurassic Morrison Formation dinosaurs. And we have amazing localities here in Colorado. But to really understand what's going on uh, here in Colorado, we have to zoom way back. So here is what the world looked like 150 million years ago when the Morrison Formation and these Jurassic dinosaurs were here in the West. Uh, you can see that the Northern Hemisphere looks pretty similar to today's Northern Hemisphere. There's some flooded uh, land masses, Europe and Asia are separated by some seas. Uh, but North America over here on the left side uh, kind of looks like North America today. The Southern Hemisphere was a completely different story. And if you've heard our talks about Madagascar and Gondwanan dinosaurs, you know that the Gondwanan continents were still rifting apart, or rafting apart, uh, pulling their dinosaur ecosystems into different new bizarre ways. Uh, but we're going to focus on the North. So here in North America, you can see there was a small sea wave that came in from the North. Uh, the states are overlaying over the top of this, so there weren't states back there back then, obviously, but you can see the states uh, overlaying. And then there's Colorado right in the middle. And so Colorado was right on the edge of these big river and lake systems that were draining to the northeast into that seaway. And it's that ecosystem uh, that we're really interested in as dinosaur paleontologists. So here in Colorado, we were the epicenter. We were the very beginning of this uh, of the dinosaur rush that led to our understanding of the Morrison dinosaurs. And it's named for the town of Morrison, just west of Denver here. Uh, you see it circled on the map of Colorado there. Uh, this is a view of Morrison. And the Morrison Formation uh, forms those slopes uh, just above the town. So there's a big capping sandstone. All of the rocks and the sandstones below that cap are from the Morrison. Those are Jurassic. 
And in 1877, Arthur Lakes uh, was doing some prospecting, walking around in the hills around Morrison uh, and around Golden and all the, the foothills here. And he stumbled on the first giant bones ever discovered from the Morrison Formation. So there you see a, an early Scientific American article on that piece from the year after he discovered them, uh, highlighting this major discovery. And what his discovery did was kick off what we now call the Bone Wars. And this was this amazing bone rush. Uh, so it was a rush between Othniel Charles Marsh there on the left and Edward Drinker Cope on the right. And they were both trying to get the newest, biggest, best, meanest, scariest dinosaurs uh, out of Colorado at the time. Uh, the, the main place that they moved to after that initial discovery was a little bit farther south in a place called Garden Park. And Garden Park is just north of what today is the town of Canyon City. Uh, and Garden Park has become one of the meccas of dinosaur discovery. And during Marsh and Cope's time, they were both pulling amazing fossils from the area. Here you can see a view of the Morrison Formation in Garden Park. Uh, and in particular, one quarry called the Marsh Felch Quarry, which was discovered by Marshall P. Felch and worked on uh, over about 11 year period, produced many firsts. So the first Apatosaurus, the first Allosaurus, the first Ceratosaurus. Uh, and all these dinosaurs at the time were new to science and they were really capturing the public's imagin imagination, especially out east. Um, both Cope and Marsh were based in the eastern US. And so all these dinosaurs were, were being loaded onto train cars and sent back to places like Philadelphia uh, and Connecticut to Yale, um, where they were studied and named and, and erected in these amazing dinosaur halls. So anytime you go to the big dinosaur museums out east, uh, you'll find Morrison Formation dinosaurs. And the Denver Museum wanted to get in on that as well. And so uh, in the early 1900s, we hired uh, a local uh, paleontologist, a local entrepreneur to help us dig a dinosaur. And it's one of the ones I'm gonna show you here in a bit on our shelf. It's called the Dewey's Diplodocus. Uh, so we wanted to keep one of those dinosaurs local. Uh, and then by the 1920s, we were making other major discoveries. And this is a discovery of a stegosaurus specimen. So you can see this worker uh, excavating the top of a femur of a stegosaurus. And that's actually the stegosaurus that's on display here at DMNS. So if you've ever been to our fossil galleries, uh, you've seen this amazing dynamic pose of a stegosaurus with its baby fighting an allosaurus. And that stegosaurus specimen, the bones uh, from that stegosaurus are integrated into this mount. So those are the real bones that were collected in the 1920s down in Garden Park. Another really neat place to find dinosaurs is on the Eastern Plains, uh, in particular, a place called Picket Wire Canyon. And this is down in Comanche National Grass Grasslands operated by the National Forest Service. And down there is one of the most amazing dinosaur trackways you'll ever see. So if you ever have a chance to go down to the Picket Wire Canyon, uh, you can go and see dinosaur footprints. There's meat eating dinosaurs, probably an allosaurus like animal. Uh, here in this picture, you see big round bathtub like uh, structures. Those are the footprints of big long-necked sauropod dinosaurs. And uh, over the past several years, um, some of the workers, the paleontologists from the National Forest Service, uh, have been collecting dinosaur bones. So I'm going to show you the real bones of this behind me on the shelf here in a minute. But this is an apatosaurus that's found in the rocks right around those trackways. Uh, that's the shoulder blade you see on the left, so a gigantic scapula. Uh, and we have much of the skeleton. We're still preparing. It takes a long time to clean the bones of a big long neck sauropod. The next little stop on our Colorado tour is all the way up in the north, just west of the city of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, there is a, a, a really nice exposure of the Morrison Formation along what's called Horse Tooth Reservoir, which, uh, a reservoir just west of town. And from that site, a discovery was made about 20 years ago of this amazing, gigantic meat-eating dinosaur. At the time, it was called Epantarius. Uh, since then, we've recleaned the bones. We've done some work on them. In fact, I have them right behind me. I can hold this one up if you can see me. So there's the upper jaw. And what's really neat about this particular dinosaur specimen is uh, we know it's an allosaurus now. And when we plot it out on this data, so this is a data set I got from my colleague Mark Lowen at the Natural History Museum of Utah, uh, where he has studied allosaurus for, for years. Uh, we can plot out juvenile, subadult, and adult sizes. And when we plot the horse tooth specimen, the one from northern Colorado, it turns out that it's the largest single allosaurus specimen ever found. So it's the very maximum size of the allosaurus reached, which is getting close to a small T. rex in size. So this is a really amazing specimen. Uh, we have much of the skull, there's parts of the neck, some of the other bones, and we think that there might even be more going into the hill. 
up at Horsetooth Reservoir. So someday we're going to have to get back out there and see if we can find more of this gigantic beast from Horsetooth. And then finally, I want to end with this particular area, very famous, uh, so famous, in fact, that the town uh, nearby was named Dinosaur. So the dinosaur region of northwestern Colorado uh, has been known to produce fossils for over a century as well. Many of those come from just across the border in Utah. Uh, so if you know about Dinosaur National Monument, the amazing Jurassic fossils from that area, uh, you're familiar with this. This is the big quarry wall. Many of the big dinosaur skeletons, uh, again, out east in the museums out east, are from this particular quarry. Um, and fortunately, they saved some of these fossils in place. So you can go and visit them, see how they were uh, deposited, how they were buried in this ancient river system. And our own Diplodocus that's on display here at the museum came from that same wall, that same quarry. So if you're here at the museum, you can see one of those bones that came from dinosaur. Uh, this is the view of dinosaur uh, from the Colorado side. Uh, this is an amazing place to go, a, a really spectacular place to, to raft down the river, uh, go for hikes. And our Allosaurus that's on display, remember the Stegosaurus is from Canyon City, but our Allosaurus was actually discovered up in this area uh, by a teenager uh, several decades ago. Uh, India Wood discovered this and had been keeping a lot of these bones uh, at home before she reported them to the Denver Museum. Um, our paleontologist went out and collected the rest of the specimen, uh, which is one of the most amazing uh, Allosaurus specimens that comes from this region in Colorado. Uh, so you should definitely come and check that out in our, in our galleries. And I just want to end with this specimen. This is one that was found by Dinosaur uh, National Monument paleontologist back in the early 90s. Uh, it turned out it was from state of Colorado, Colorado land, so it belongs to the people of Colorado. So it was sent here to the Denver Museum where we, we preserve many different uh, state fossils and state specimens. Um, and this is a dinosaur that's a little bit rare. You might not have even heard of it. It's called Marshosaurus. So it's named after Marsh. And I want to show you some of these pictures. So I'm going to stop the sharing so I can show you some of these bones firsthand. So here is the upper jaw. So it's not a very big dinosaur. You can see the teeth down here on my hand. So this is the upper jaw of this dinosaur called Marshosaurus. Marshosaurus was known from a quarry in Eastern Utah. Uh, and over the past uh, several decades, we've only found an additional uh, two specimens. This is one of two new specimens of Marshosaurus. Uh, but there's some features on this skull that are a little bit different from the original Marshosaurus, especially on the inside, the way that these bones fit together, the palate, the angle of this uh, bony process that goes up onto the top of the nose. And so at this point, we now think that this might represent a different type of Marchosaurus, or maybe even a completely different type of dinosaur, uh, meat-eating dinosaur. So we're still making amazing discoveries from the Morrison Formation. It's not uh, one of those dinosaur units where we've learned everything we can. We still need to get out, we still need to dig. So for the next minute or two, I want to take you on a little tour, so I'm going to pick you up. So buckle your seat belts. We're about to move around, uh, just to give you a sense of what we have down here in our collections. So here in this drawer, you can see some long-necked dinosaur bones. These are from uh, northeastern Wyoming, so outside of Colorado. But these represent small long-necked dinosaurs. So even though this is a really big vertebra, this is actually from a relatively small long-necked dinosaur. I'm going to take you around over here to show you some more of these bones. So when I say small, I mean the size of a big mammoth still, but it's still relatively small, at least for this type of dinosaur. There's leg bones, a shoulder blade. I'll show you the shoulder blade in particular. So notice the shoulder blade with the size of my hand. And now we're going to zoom back to that southeastern Colorado shoulder blade I told you about. So this is the shoulder blade I showed you with that uh, volunteer laying next to it. So here's a gigantic apatosaurus or brontosaurus shoulder blade, this bone called the scapula and the coracoid. We have other bones of that individual on the shelves here. This is a neck bone. We've got leg, leg bones. This is the upper arm bone or the humerus. And then the last one I want to show you is our very first dinosaur. So remember I told you about the Dewey's Diplodocus back in the early 1900s. This one was actually excavated in 1915 and sent up here to the Denver Museum as our very first dinosaur specimen, so over 100 years ago. 
So with that, I'll stop spinning you around and I'd love to get some of your questions. So I'm gonna set this back down. Huh, now that I'm out of breath. <laughs> I mean, I have to say that was pretty incredible, not only uh, learning about the rich history of fossil finding in Colorado, but also seeing some of these pretty spectacular specimens that we have in our collections. Um, if you have questions for uh, Joe, our expert, um, you can post them in the comments. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. We got about 15 minutes for questions. I also know it's tough to think of questions off the top of your head. So that's why I'm here. I've got a question for you, Joe. Yeah. Um, you had talked about how in the late Jurassic, large dinosaurs like Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, Apatosaurus really began to dominate the landscape. Now, we've been finding these creatures here in Colorado for over a century. Uh, what has these specimens that either we have or other institutions have discovered revealed about how this process happened? Why suddenly at this moment did these dinosaurs get huge? That's a really interesting question. And that is one that paleontologists are working on right now. So there's a lot that goes into the biomechanics. So how does an animal, a vertebrate animal get to be large and overcome all of the other pressures of things like gravity and getting enough food and pumping blood into the brain. And so there are various paleontologists working on all aspects of that big question. But one thing we know is that dinosaurs started to have a more bird-like respiration. And so by adding a bird-like lung and respiratory system, you then add air to the bones. So birds have hollow air-filled bones. And we know that the huge long-necked dinosaurs and even the big dinosaurs like Allosaurus had air invading most of their vertebrae and even uh, some of their limb bones. And so if you think about that, uh, that allows you to not only stay a lot cooler because you're full of air instead of a big solid mass, but also makes you a lot lighter. So you can get bigger uh, for the same weight. And so we think that that uh, evolution of that respiratory system had a little bit to play in the evolution of gigantism. And then there was a bit of an arms race probably with dinosaurs trying to get bigger to escape predators and predators getting bigger uh, to be able to take on those bigger herbivores. And so there was a bit of an arms race happening at the same time as well. So all these factors play in together and we're still learning a lot about dinosaurs and biomechanics by looking at these fossils. Oh, my screen's green. Oh, my camera. <laughs> like uh, a dinosaur. You forgive the greed. I'm going to turn off my video for just a second, but you'll still be able to hear my voice because we have a question for you from our comments. Is there anybody uh, in the museum or is, is there a, a sort of scientist position that is simply going through old specimens to try to determine what might have been missed or what we have? Yeah, we have a huge staff of collections managers and collections assistants here. So we have everybody from a collections manager and an assistant collections manager all the way down to interns. Uh, and some of those are paid interns that help us go through these fossils. And we are, we're sorting through each of these drawers as the curator, I come down and I help, I help make identifications. And that's how we're making additional uh, discoveries in our drawers. And there are several other smaller specimens that maybe in a future science live I'll get to share with you. Today was just about the giants, but maybe we'll do the, the tiny things of the Jurassic next. Um, and I can show you some of those other new discoveries. That includes little lizards that ate plants. Uh, we just published an amazing paper on one of those lizards and how it chewed and how the wear facets on its teeth were. And so there's a lot of new discoveries being made and it's assisted by our collection staff, our preparation staff, and our scientists. Awesome. And I'm not green anymore. You're That's back. A plus. You know, it's not easy being green. That's what Kermit says. Uh, <laughs> we have another question. Do we have any specimens in our collections from the Hell Creek Formation? We do. We have a huge collection from both the Hell Creek and the Lance Creek Formations. Those are deposited at the very end of the Cretaceous. And they're the same age as the rocks that Denver sits on. So the Denver formation that sits under uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is the same age as the Hell Creek. So we have uh, amazing fossils from Montana and the Dakotas from the Hell Creek, and then amazing local fossils like the Taurosaurus from Thornton uh, and the Highlands Ranch Triceratops, which are the exact same age. And that's just a few rows that direction. So loaded with T-Rex and dome-headed dinosaurs and tons of Triceratops. And you had mentioned um, interns. Do, you, do we have teen interns at the museum? Yeah, every summer we'd run a program called the Teen Science Scholars. And right now we're in the middle of our Teen Science Scholars investigations where we have uh, six different teens here in Earth Sciences working on various aspects of paleontology, 
uh, from fossil plants and fossil mammals to fossil dinosaurs that I work on. Uh, many of them work up in our digital research lab uh, with our amazing team up there where they're reconstructing digitally the, the internal anatomy and the structures of these fossils. Uh, and some of them work down here in collections and they're helping us sort and do some of that work that I mentioned earlier, where we're making new discoveries from our own shelves all around us. I'm green again, uh, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, I, you know, I was really into paleontology when I was younger and I, I feel like, man, I wish I had tried to be a teen science scholar, but the opportunities are out there. And speaking of opportunities, is that the only way that we engage with teens at the museum? Are there other groups that go fossil finding or even non-teens? I mean, I, I'd still love to go out into the field and see what I could find. Um, what kind of opportunities are there for, for people to go uh, hunt for fossils? Yeah, here at the Denver Museum, we operate what's probably the most vibrant paleontology volunteer program anywhere in the world. So we have more volunteers doing more different uh, activities in the field, in the labs, in the collections than any other museum. Uh, we take volunteers out on digs to Utah, to North Dakota and Montana, uh, down to New Mexico. And we do digs all around here all the time where we're working in places like Colorado Springs or up north in Weld County where we have other Triceratops fossils. And so there are lots of ways to get involved as a volunteer. And again, as a teen, you, get, you have the teen science scholars, but I work with lots of teens uh, outside of that program, helping them uh, find their path find their way into paleontology, where we need a lot of new blood. We need a lot of new ideas, and there are amazing ideas coming from uh, young people today who have amazing skills and everything from uh, computers to visualization. And we have another question, uh, the, the green. We have another question coming in from the comments. Um, how does studying extinct ecosystems and creatures help inform our modern world? I know that sometimes when we think about scientific endeavors, they seem very removed from our day-to-day -day lives, but I'd imagine as somebody whose day-to-day -day life is studying these extinct creatures and organisms and ecosystems, how does learning about these things in, inform us today? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one that I, I get all the time, and it's one that I'm always thinking about. And I like to think about it in two ways. First, as evolutionary biologists, uh, we can look at the evolution of animals today on human time scales. So we're doing long-term studies that might go back uh, 50 to maybe even 100 years. But to really understand the dynamics of evolution and the way animals and plants and the biotic world changes through time, we have to look at long time periods. So we have to look at hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. And the only way to do that is to go back into the past where we have that fossil record. So paleontology teaches us about how evolution works, how things change through time. And the other aspect of that is somewhat related, and that's looking at how the world system, so uh, the abiotic, the non-living part of the earth, so the geology, the climate, uh, the ocean, all of that influences evolution. And so we can look and see what it was like here on earth when it was really hot uh, during the end of the Paleocene, and early Eocene. We can go back into the time of dinosaurs when the, the entire globe was a greenhouse and we didn't have ice caps. And we can understand how life changes with these abiotic perturbations, with changes in climate, with changes uh, in mountains and changes in sea level. And that really helps us understand the world around us today. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about how interconnected everything is. And even over such a, a, an expanse of hundreds of millions of years, how informative uh, small things can be and how it affects our everyday life. Um, when we think about finding Cretaceous fossils in Colorado, how do Cretaceous fossils, like those we find, like the Taurosaur in Thornton, how do those compare to Cretaceous fossils found in other regions? You, in your map, you sort of showed how much of Colorado is that Morrison formation, but you can even find it in places like the Panhandle of Oklahoma. So if we were to, to apply that to the Hell Creek Formation, what is it like finding Cretaceous creatures here as opposed to say like Utah or, or Nebraska or Wyoming or someplace like that? So the Cretaceous, at least here in North America, was a really dynamic time. So we had the first uh, bits of the Rocky Mountains starting to push up about 85 million years ago. Uh, the, the middle of the continent was covered by a big seaway, which influenced things like climate and sea level. Um, and then there's a weird distribution of dinosaurs, at least about 76 million years ago, where you have dinosaurs that are completely different living in places like Canada and Montana than you do in the South in places like Texas and Utah. 
And so we know that there's some sort of latitudinal gradient like we have today where you have jaguars in the south and mountain lions in the north. Um, and so we can actually study that in the past. But something weird happens around the very end of the time of the dinosaurs when we have Taurosaurus here in Colorado. And it's a big shift toward what we call cosmopolitanism. So dinosaurs uh, that are living in one place are found far, far away. So uh, things like Triceratops lived from uh, the Mexico-US border in the south all the way up into southern Canada. And so there's a big shift that we're still trying to understand uh, between this local latitudinal provincialism and then what we call cosmopolitanism or wide distribution of the same types of dinosaurs. Interesting. Uh, we have a question here from the comments and you know, it, it's wondering about whether or not there will be any attempts to genetically isolate a, a dinosaur from a living bird species. And listen, I love Jurassic Park, so I'm, I'm big on your answer to this question. So what do you say? Are we gonna have a Jurassic Park someday? Uh, we're going to reverse engineer a chicken into a T-Rex? Yeah, I think reverse engineering is the only way we're going to really get at some of these features that you see in dinosaurs. So uh, this work is being uh, undertaken right now by molecular biologists and geneticists, uh, where they're going into things like chickens or turkeys, um, common poultry, and trying to find those ancient uh, fossil, what we'd call a fossil gene that still lives in their genome, and turn it back on and see what it does. And sometimes you get the development of a longer bony tail, or you get the development of teeth in the beak. Birds don't have teeth today. So weird things are still in there, coded in their genetic uh, blueprints. And so that is the best way, I think, to get at what um, some of these dinosaurs might have looked like, or at least how they, uh, they grew and, and changed through their ontogeny as they became adults. Well, interesting. I never really thought about that. But yeah, I, I can see that. You know, it seems like such a fantastical science fiction idea, but. They still have teeth genes. So yeah, there's still hidden teeth. genes inside of a chicken that you can turn on and it'll develop teeth again. I make cool. me wonder what genes, what fossil genes I have hiding in myself. Yeah, uh, you might well, have some amphibian genes. You can get some frog legs going. Listen, I do love to swim. I do love to swim. <laughs> We've got uh, just a, a few minutes left. So right here at the end of our program, I've got one final question for you. And that is, um, uh, I don't know if you've worked specifically in the Colorado region, but I know that you've worked around the world digging up all sorts of incredible fossils. What is the one moment in the field that you would want to share with our guests that really, it was that moment where you're like, I love what I do. This is incredible. I and mean, there's probably too many to count, but if you could share one with us, I would really appreciate it. I think I would say it was the discovery of the Thornton Taurosaurus. So there's this idea that's always been around there that you can dig up dinosaurs in your backyard. Movies have been made about it, but that was that one chance uh, uh, bulldozer discovery where a dinosaur was actually found right there in our own backyards. Um, and it's happened several times since. In fact, this is another one. This is an Allosaurus tibia. So going back to the Jurassic, this is a tibia that was found by someone in their backyard in Canyon City. And so that moment that you can find dinosaurs in your backyard here in Colorado along the Front Range that most people all around the world don't have the opportunity to do. And we live on dinosaur bearing rocks. And so we're surrounded by this really amazing history. And that discovery brought it all home for me. That's really cool. Well, I, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing uh, with us today, Joe. We really appreciate it. I, you know, I didn't realize how rich of a history we had of finding Jurassic giants, right? Like you said, in our own backyard. We had some really awesome questions from the comments. I, I, so thank you everybody for those wonderful questions. Uh, we hope you stay interested in science. We hope to see you soon. And uh, Joe, you're going out into the field soon, I know. So I hope you have some some help, uh, some good discoveries and are able to do some awesome science out there. We're all wishing you good luck. And thanks again for joining us. Bye everybody. Yeah, thanks everybody. It was fun.